we discussed about uh, two dimensional steady state heat conduction and we will take it up from there. Uh, we discussed about one simple problem that you have a domain like this with these as the boundary conditions and this is the equation which we solved. Now, we will try to develop some physical insight about this problem. So, to develop the physical insight, let us take an example, let us say let us say f 1 x equal to 100 a constant. So, in that case if you consider this domain then how will the constant temperature lines or isotherms look like that is what we want to schematically show. So, this kind of physical insight is important because many times you can solve the problem and then find that graphically plot the solution, but if you have a good physical intuition good physical insight you can schematically draw the graphical representation without even solving the problem and that kind of skill is important for solving practical problems. So, uh, now here you see that the temperature here is throughout 100, but here it is 0 in this boundaries it is 0. So, what is the predominant direction in which temperature gradient is created? the predominant direction in which the temperature gradient is created is the y direction, because it is changing from 0 to 100 here. Along x also there is a gradient, but the gradient gives a periodic nature of the solution. Okay. It is not it is not a non periodic solution, it is a periodic solution along x and a non periodic solution along y. So, that will mean that you will get constant temperature lines like this. What is the value of this? This is 100. Let us say this is 50, this is 25 like that. Okay. So, you will see that constant temperature lines will be like this. Now, there are typical situations when the boundaries are adiabatic and how will the constant temperature lines be at the boundary when the boundary is adiabatic. Let us consider a second example, this is example 1, example 2. Let us say these two boundaries are adiabatic. When you have adiabatic boundaries, you will have constant temperature line perpendicular to the boundary and the reason is obvious. If it is adiabatic then what does it mean? It means that the heat flux is 0, that means the normal temperature gradient is 0, that means along the normal direction temperature is not changing, therefore the normal direction is an isotherm or constant temperature line. Okay. So, this kind of a situation for example, you will get isotherms like this. 
you will get let us say this is 100 and this is 0, so you will get isotherms like this. Now, all these examples give rise to some ambiguity and let us try to discuss about that ambiguity. Now, let us look into this problem. Here the temperature is 100 here the temperature is 0, non I mean uh, the shifted temperature that is theta is T minus some T 0, let us say this is 0, this is 0, this is 0 and this is 100. The question is and this is a question which we always like to avoid is that what is the temperature here or what is the temperature here, right? This is the problem we always try to avoid and why we try to avoid this is because when the theories of differential equations are discussed over boundaries, the boundaries normally are not having any corner, they are smoothly connected boundaries. Now here you are having boundaries with corners and these are practical problems like in engineering you will often get boundaries with corners. So, the question is what is the temperature here? So, in mathematical analysis if you are solving the problem numerically then this is this kind of question is tackled in a different way. So, if you have a domain if you are solving this problem numerically I told you that this belongs to uh, the CFD for uh, like uh, solving these problems numerically, but uh, just to get a get some idea that what is done if you want to solve this problem numerically. You what you basically do you divide the domain into a number of subdomains, discrete subdomains and you may mark each subdomain with a grid point, maybe the centroid of each subdomain. These subdomains are called sometimes elements, some in elements in finite element method, control volume in finite volume method and so on. So, there are different names of these subdomains. So, you if you have these points, these are discrete points. And then you also have discrete points on the boundaries because boundary condition needs to be in incorporated. Okay. Now so, there are some here also, but you can see that very purposefully these points are not considered to be parts of the discretization, right. So, what you are doing? You are trying to write algebraic equations instead of your differential equation. So, you convert your differential equation into a system of algebraic equations, each equation for each of these circle points. So, as many number of circle points you have, so many number of algebraic equations you have, then you solve a system of algebraic equation by standard methods in linear algebra, that is what you do. But these corner points are not considered. So, why these corner points are not considered? is because these are points of singularity. So, at this point the temperature is neither 100 nor 0. Sometimes some people do it like this, they say that okay, let us make it 100 plus 0 by 2. That is not, I mean there is everything in that except science. So, I mean that that is that is not the proper way of handling it. So, uh, 
these points are usually avoided because these are points of singularity and you because these belong to two boundaries and these two boundaries have different conditions therefore, it is impossible to impose a condition at that common point. Okay. So, typically this point is just excluded. So, excluding this point, so when you draw the isotherm, it, it, is, it shows that this point is included, but actually this is slightly epsilon distance away from the corner because in the limit that epsilon tends to 0. So, in drawing the figure we cannot show it, but conceptually it is a small epsilon from the corner where the epsilon tends to 0, but is not exactly equal to 0 because those are points of singularity. There is another example which I want to consider where we relax the boundary condition and consider a problem like this. Okay. You have a domain like this this is your domain you are interested to find out the solution for theta within the domain. Now, this clearly does not satisfy the requirement that 3 of the 4 boundary conditions are homogeneous. Here only 2 boundary conditions are homogeneous and 2 are not. So, this kind of problem can be solved by using the principle of superposition. So, how this can be done? This is equivalent to 2 problems. Theta 1 is equal to 0 theta 1 is equal to 0, theta 1 is equal to 0 and theta 1 is equal to f 2 x plus theta 2 is equal to 0, theta 2 is equal to 0, theta 2 is equal to 0 and theta 2 is equal to f 2 y. F okay. So, this will be governed by del square theta 1 del x 1 square plus del square theta 1 uh, sorry del x square plus del y square equal to 0. This is del square theta 2 del x square plus del square theta 2 del y square is equal to 0 and the general solution is theta 1 plus theta 2. The reason is that because the governing differential equation is linear if theta is equal to theta 1 is a solution and theta is equal to theta 2 is a solution theta equal to theta 1 plus theta 2 is also a solution to the governing differential equation. Which is shown here. Okay. So, this kind of superposition technique we can use for linear problems, we cannot use for non linear problems. So, in many problems where fluid flow is present, then uh, certain non linearities may come, may come or may not come. So, if non linearities come, then we cannot use this technique anymore. Okay. So, this is uh, about uh, the two dimensional steady state problems. Now, uh, we will give you some homework assignments and uh, homework assignments will be uploaded and uh, I would like to 
uh, ensure that we uh, send the homework assignments a priori to you over email and uh, like for the MOOC course it will be uploaded in some site and then uh, there will be a separate tutorial when we discuss about the solutions of the specific problems. So, the way in which we go about this course is that we work out some problems in the class, we give you some homework problems some of out of which some of them have might have already been worked out in the class or some are straightforward extensions. For example, I can give you a homework problem where f 1 x is equal to a x. This is a problem uh, from the exercise of the textbook of Incropera. So, f 1 x equal to a x. Now, it, it is only a simple integration that uh, you have to do because the entire framework I have developed already in the class. So, in heat transfer remember sometimes students say where is the problem because it is very difficult to understand what is theory and what is the problem. In heat transfer everything is theory and everything is problem. So, there is no distinction between it is not like a junior school level thing so that you have a formula you mug it up and then you put a value in the formula it becomes a problem. So, that kind of education in heat transfer we are not going to provide you. So, problem means it is basically from the scratch from the first principles you have to derive and if there are numerical values you just have to plug in the numerical values, but we do not expect that you remember any formula to solve any problem. That is the kind of philosophy that we will adopt in, in the course of heat transfer. So, no formula based study please. Okay. Now, uh, we will move on to our next issue in the conduction heat transfer which is uh, unsteady. Of course, we have done steady state problems. So, the next obvious extension is unsteady, but it is something there is something in between which is neither steady nor unsteady and that is called as quasi steady and I will discuss some such problem before coming into the unsteady problem. So, quasi steady has some resemblance with the quasi static or quasi equilibrium process that you must have studied in thermodynamics. So, again the only distinction is that there is a difference between steady and equilibrium. So, that much of difference is there, but notionally if you think of so let So, think of a problem in thermodynamics a classical situation when there is a piston moving in a cylinder. Okay. Very classical problems in thermodynamics involve a piston moving in a cylinder, may be there is some gas in between the piston and the cylinder. Let us say that you have some weights on the top of the piston. The weights are such that these are very thin slices. So, what will happen? You remove this top slice, this piston will go up by a little bit. right? Then you remove the next slice, the piston will go further up by a little bit because for a given mass the pressure is decreasing. So, the volume is increasing right. So, it is it in this way it will undergo a very slow expansion such that for the entire expansion process all the in between states are almost in thermodynamic equilibrium. So, and the deviation from thermodynamic equilibrium is very little. So, the key word is that this is a very slow process because it is a very slow process the uns the deviation from equilibrium is almost nil. So, that kind of process is called as quasi static or quasi equilibrium process in thermodynamics. So, similar analogy in heat transfer not exactly the same again I am giving you a caution there is a difference between steady state and equilibrium which we have discussed. So, similar analogy in heat transfer is a quasi steady, quasi steady means in the long run it is unsteady because things are changing with time, but the change is so slow that all the 
entire change can be thought of as a collection of a change taking place through a large number of intermediate steady states. That kind of process is called as a quasi steady process. So now I will discuss about an engineering problem uh, as an example you may think of it as a problem or as an example whatever. Let us say making of ice. Ice making is a big industry and there are many ways in which ice can be made. Now uh, there is a situation something like this, you have a metal plate and there is a refrigerant which is flowing below the metal plate with a particular velocity and there is a heat loss. So over this there is water. So this water, see let us say this refrigerant is at minus 10 degree centigrade. Okay. So this water because it is at a higher temperature as compared to this, it will lose heat through this metal plate by conduction and once the heat is lost it will come to a state when the temperature comes at the freezing point of water and then some ice will be formed. The water converted into ice its layer will thicken and beyond a critical thickness that is scraped off and new layer of ice starts forming. So this is a simple old style technology of making ice. Okay. So now let us make a heat transfer analysis for this particular problem. So we can make a quasi steady type of analysis, but this is a very interesting problem where we are involving a change of phase. So far in the problem in the theoretical description of heat transfer we have purposefully avoided problems with change of phase. Now let us bring into an example where we have a change of phase. So let us say that this is an interface okay. on this side there is solid on this side there is liquid. I am not discussing about this problem first but I am discussing about a different problem just to know that how, what kind of boundary condition you should use at the interface between the ice and the water. So we are taking an example which is little bit different, this is melting of a solid. So let us say there is a solid, there is a heat transfer here. Let us say it is a one dimensional situation, there is a heat transfer along x. So some heat is utilized for melting the solid to liquid. Let us say that we take a small control volume like this surrounding the interface, this control volume is of thickness delta x. In the limit as delta x tends to 0, we can recover a sharp interface. In reality, in the molecular world, no interface is sharp because there are molecules in one phase and molecules in the other phase and there is a gradual transition when you go from the molecular arrangement of one phase to the molecular arrangement of another phase. So it is not sharp, but macroscopically if you see it will appear to be a sharp interface and that sharp interface is recovered in the limit as delta x tends to 0. But we take a control volume like this and let us say that there is a rate of heat transfer q dot in and there is a rate of heat transfer q dot out. Let us say A is the area of the 
interface perpendicular to the direction of heat transfer. So, what is Q dot in? This is minus K A ok. by Fourier's law. What is Q dot out? Similar term Now, which one is more q dot in or q dot out? Some heat has been transferred to the control volume and something is leaving. Now, in between what has happened? In between the solid has converted into liquid. So, what has been the case? When the solid has converted into liquid, some heat has been taken by the solid to get converted into liquid in the form of latent heat. So, whatever is going out must be less than whatever has come in because whatever is going out and whatever is going in whatever has gone in a part of that is utilized for melting. So, whatever is going out is less than whatever has gone in. So, we can say Q dot in minus Q dot latent is equal to Q dot out right. What is Q dot latent? So, M dot M not into the latent heat which is let us say HSF. Okay. We will see what is M dot, but I mean just symbol wise this is the rate of uh, mass being converted from solid to liquid and that multiplied by the latent heat is the total latent energy transfer. Okay. Now, if you divide both the terms or all the terms by the cross sectional area then M naught by A let us say that is mass flux m double dash then we can write minus k Of course, what is this? So, what is M dot actually? The rho into A into delta x, this is the mass divided by the time delta t over which this phase change process is being studied. 
So, m double dash is that divided by a. So, this becomes rho into limit as delta t tends to 0 delta x by delta t right. Because why we lay make the limit as delta x tends delta t tends to 0? Because in the limit as delta t tends to 0 delta x will also tend to 0 then only this interface will become a sharp interface macroscopically ok. So, this will become ok. Now, there is something which is more interesting at this undergraduate level I do not want to bring this issue, but just an open question which you think about this is rho of which rho of liquid or rho of solid yes rho of liquid or rho of solid. So, sometimes you know when you give an answer in the answer book you write something here then if I say that it is liquid you say I have written liquid you cannot see it and because as professors we are old with spectacles and all then uh, I mean it is expected that we cannot see it. So, you can keep it fuzzy, but heat transfer is not a topic of fuzzy logic it is different fuzzy logic is a different uh, subject and heat transfer is a different subject. So, there is no fuzzy answer to it I will complicate the question by even one more standard what is that let us say that the density of the solid and liquid is different and that is practical usually if a substance melts either it will expand or it will contract. So, the densities are different then how is this differential density taken into account in this ok. These are two questions which I keep open for this particular case we will consider that density of the solid and the liquid phase are equal. So, that uh, that ambiguity is not there. So, you can consider this as either rho s or rho l this, but I will ask you the answer. So, please think about it it is a it is a question of for thinking. Now, this type of boundary condition this is what this type of boundary condition in heat transfer is an interfacial boundary condition known as Stefan boundary condition ok. So, you can use this Stefan boundary condition for heat transfer for a phase change any phase change if it is evaporation condensation just these things will change for evaporation this will become HFG from saturated liquid to saturated vapor whatever is the latent heat if there is no phase change then this term will be 0 right. So, at the interface what is the boundary condition that you have minus k del t del x is continuous why because interface cannot store thermal energy. So, whatever thermal energy has come to the interface the same thermal energy should be transferred to the other side of the interface. So, minus k into temperature gradient normal to the interface that is continuous. What is the analogy in fluid mechanics if you have flat interface and let us say that you have a velocity profile along y then mu du dy is continuous across the interface. So, if you have liquid and vapor so mu liquid into du dy at the liquid is same as mu vapor into du dy at the vapor of course this will be little bit disturbed if you have a curved interface and so on. But I am not bringing that complication at this level I am just trying to give you an analogy between heat transfer and fluid mechanics. Now, uh, how do we apply that formula to this particular problem this problem is just inverse of this problem where instead of melting it is freezing ok. Now, let us try to assess the problem by assuming that this is a layer of ice that has been formed and let us say the thickness is x. 
so now can you draw the temperature profile so within the system so first of all this is a metallic plate why do we use a metallic plate in this case in engineering see metallic plate will have a very high thermal conductivity so the temperature drop within the plate is very small or temperature rise rather in this case not drop temperature rise within that is small so that means virtually the water is exposed to a temperature which is close to minus 10 without any substantial increase within the metallic plate okay so if you want to draw a temperature profile so virtually there is there will be some little change because it will have some conductivity then within the ice it is pure one dimensional conduction so there will be a linear temperature profile and then within water the temperature gradient will not be as sharp as that in the ice so you can safely neglect this term the temperature gradient in the liquid phase is much much less than the temperature gradient which is there here because the temperature gradient is virtually is primarily imposed across this okay so you are left with these two terms this term and this term so let us say that the temperature here is ts and the temperature this minus 10 degree centigrade is t infinity so how do you write this term you write k of solid into the temperature gradient so basically you write ts minus t infinity now when you write ts minus t infinity you have to take the resistance of this phase plus the resistance due to convection here the resistance due to conduction here is very small because the conductivity of the plate is very high so you have basically three resistances in series one resistance is because of the flow of the refrigerant this refrigerant is flowing so what is what kind of resistance it is creating it's a convective resistance so uh, let us say h is the heat transfer convective heat transfer coefficient here and this is the conductive resistance due to of course the area is absorbed here because it is already divided by area that is why the area is not put put there this term balances the other term that is rho into hsf into dx dt right so now you can integrate this with respect to x to find out x as a function of time okay so that's a simple straight forward integration i am not putting that here so this will tell you that how do you design the system because if you want to design the system you have to design that what is the thickness of the ice that is formed at a given time because that is your productivity that is your productivity so you must keep a proper design and you will see that what are the parameters which are defining this 
that what is the temperature here what is T infinity and what are what is the conductivity of the solid and what is the heat transfer coefficient. Heat transfer coefficient will be higher if you flow the refrigerant at a higher speed. So that is where convection will come into the picture. Okay. Now we will move on to unsteady state heat conduction. When we think of unsteady state heat conduction, the situation is that we are considering that temperature is also a function of time. So, as I told you earlier that all problems are fundamentally unsteady. So, we are doing unsteady state analysis when our time domain of interest is such that over that domain temperature is changing with time, over that time domain the temperature is changing with time. Now, temperature is changing with time, but temperature is also changing with respect to space. It is not just change with respect to time, but also change with respect to space. So, with respect to space, it can be one dimensional, it can be two dimensional, it can be three dimensional, but we will start with something which is easier than all this that is zero dimensional. That means, with respect to space there is no variation and with respect to time only there is variation. So, we will consider something it is not used this terminology is not used in books, but in a loose sense it is like a 0 dimensional problem. And the corresponding mathematical modeling is known as lumped parameter approach. In lumped parameter approach, what we are trying to do? We are trying to neglect the temperature variation as a function of position and only consider temperature variation as a function of time. Let me give you an example. Let us start with an engineering example. In manufacturing or in processing of materials, there is a process which is called as quenching. Okay. Quenching is a heat treatment process. So, in quenching what happens? Let us say you have a metal block which you had heated. So, heat treatments are done in materials industry to give certain material properties to impart certain properties to the material. Now, once the heat treatment is done that is it is heated it may be heated in air it may be heated in furnace or whatever then the material is cooled and sometimes it is cooled very rapidly it is cooled very rapidly by immersing it in some fluid. So, the material is hot and then it is suddenly put in a cold fluid and the material will uh, cool down almost instantaneously. This process is called as quenching. Okay. Now, this process from material science point of view is very interesting because quenching will have very little time for heat transfer given and very little time for change to take place and over this little time the grains in the material will not be able to grow by a long way. So, there will be fine grain microstructure and that can give rise to a good amount of hardness to the material. So, see this is this is how an engineering problem is when you go to an industry nobody will tell you this is the problem of mechanical engineering, this is the problem of chemical engineering, this is the problem of material science this is you have to use a holistic approach. So, this is the problem that you want to solve. So, let us say you want to predict the microstructure. Why do you want to predict the microstructure? 
because the microstructure will dictate what will be the mechanical property of the material say that is a steel ball and that steel ball will be used for making some structures. So depending on the property uh, the depending on the microstructure the property of the steel ball will be different and it will behave mechanically different. So how do you know that what will be the microstructure? The microstructure is a function of the cooling rate that means the rate at which the temperature of the steel ball decreases with time in this case in some other case it might also increase but for quenching process of course it decreases the rate at which it decreases accordingly the microstructure develops. So the microstructure has a very important relationship with the heat transfer in general and the temperature gradient with respect to time in particular. So our objective will be to figure out how temperature of the steel ball is changing with time during the quenching process. So let us draw a schematic of the problem. So this is the bath. and this is the ball okay so for zero dimensional analysis we consider this ball to be a lumped mass what is the analogy in mechanics it is a particle in mechanics when we say particle what we assume even rigid bodies we can assume as particles if there is no rotation so what does it mean? So let us say that we write Newton's second law of motion for a particle. Now sometimes a car is also modeled as a particle. As practical engineers we can argue that is car a point mass? Car is not a point mass. But for all practical purposes the entire motion of that may be conceptualized as a translatory motion of the maybe say center of mass which is the point mass. Okay. So similarly for under certain conditions we will answer this question that under what conditions under certain conditions we can study the heat transfer here by neglecting the temperature variation within the ball that is we can assume that the entire ball is at a uniform temperature specially uniform temperature I will discuss that under what conditions that is valid and under what conditions that is not valid. But let us first assume that that is valid. So if that is valid then let us say that you have a system which is the block. So energy in we can write an energy balance energy in minus energy out plus energy generated. Okay. So this is the energy balance that in the very first lecture which I delivered I talked about this the energy balance of the system. Now this is losing heat to its surroundings by say convection and radiation. So let us say H is the convective heat transfer coefficient and epsilon is the emissivity of the surface. So what is energy in what is the rate at which energy is entering the control volume there is no energy in it is only losing energy because of cooling. So energy in is 0 what is energy out? Let us say that temperature of the bulk fluid is T infinity. So A H T minus T infinity right 
this is heat loss by convection this is heat loss by radiation of course the minus sign is there before both of these okay this ts is what ts is the temperature at the surface of the ball okay what is energy generation there is no energy generation in this case but i will work out a problem in the class where there is energy generation now what is energy of the control volume this is a solid one so it is internal energy that is what rho into the volume this is the mass into c into t so we can write now if we assume that this is like a lump mass then the temperature everywhere within the mass is same so this ts is as good as temperature anywhere within the body this is a lump parameter analysis and then because temperature is everywhere uniform specially temperature variation with time is the only derivative of temperature so you can write this as ordinary derivative instead of partial derivative so this is an ordinary differential equation governing the temperature as a function of time now if you consider all these terms together the integration may be a little bit cumbersome but you can consider two limiting cases in one case convection is dominating in another case radiation is dominating so limiting cases conduction dominating over radiation then you have hmm? sorry convection dominating over radiation right convection now you can solve this equation let us say that theta is equal to t minus t infinity so you can write
d theta by theta is equal to minus a h by rho c v d t. So, if you integrate this ln theta is equal to minus a h by rho c v t plus ln c 1 where ln c 1 is the constant of integration. So, theta is equal to c 1 into e to the power minus a h by rho c v t. How do you get c 1? You can use the initial condition at time equal to 0 t is equal to t i which is the initial temperature. So, theta is equal to T i minus T infinity that is theta i. So, you will get theta is equal to theta i e to the power minus h by rho C v t. Okay. Now, let us try to develop some physical insight on this. First of all, this term in the box must be non dimensional, because when you write e to the power something that something must be non dimensional. It is quite clear when you write e to the power x 1 plus x by factorial 1 plus x square by factorial 2 like that. So, if x has a dimension then dimensionally it will never match. So, e to the power something that something has to be non dimensional. So, this is something which is a non dimensional number. So, a h by rho c v t that can be written as t by some tau, but this tau is called as the time constant of the problem. Now, this can also be written with some electrical analogy. What is this? This is like a capacitance, this is a storage ability of the system to store thermal energy. So, this is like capacitance and this is what? This is 1 by resistance. So, this is like R c in a R c circuit in electrical circuit theory. So, you will get similar type of characteristics for a the current voltage type of relationship in an R c circuit in circuit theory in electrical engineering. So, that is an analogy with the electrical thing, but what is left for us to understand is what is the physical significance of this time constant, how can you use it for a practical problem. Not only that under what conditions this solution will remain valid, because we have assumed that the lumped model is valid that the entire solid is at a uniform temperature, but where is the guarantee that the entire solid is at a uniform temperature. So, we will figure that out that under what conditions the entire solid is at a uniform temperature and under what conditions it may not be considered to be so. So, we will take a short break of about 5 minutes and then we will continue with this discussion. <laughs>